Not being able to master the basics will always leave you with bad animation, especially if you're a beginner. But I'm here to tell you animation isn't as hard as you might think, and you only need to follow these steps to become a pro in minutes. So grab the latest copy of Blender and let's get started. I'll be using this bouncing ball rig which has some nice squash and stretch controls and you can get it for free using the link below. Some of you might be familiar with the bouncing ball exercise but what most of you don't know is it's often taught incorrectly. It's not just about making the ball bounce up and down, it's about mastering these three principles. So let's get to grips with timing and spacing. For this you need to set a couple of keyframes. So make sure you're in pose mode and with the main control selected you can set a key by pressing I and then selecting location. Move a few frames forward and set a key with the ball in the air. And for the last frame, we can duplicate the first one and move it to the end of the timeline. Now, if we play our animation, we get something that, well, it looks awful. And the reason for this is bad timing and spacing. And it's something a lot of beginners struggle with. So let's fix it. For this, we want the ball to have large spacing when it's moving up and down and small spacing when it's at the top of the jump. To do this, we can set the ends of our animation curve to vector by selecting the two end keyframes pressing V and selecting vector, making our curve look more like an upside down U. Now you can see the difference and it's starting to look a little bit better, but to push it even further, we can add a little bit of hang time by scaling the middle keyframe. Make sure the pivot point is set to bounding box and in the graph editor, select the middle keyframe and press S to scale it. We don't want too much, otherwise it will start to look a bit weightless. We can even adjust the timing here too by scaling all the keyframes. Set the pivot point to 2D cursor and then scale them in the graph editor by pressing S to speed up or slow down the whole animation. Generally, the faster the animation, the lighter the object, and the slower the animation, the slower the object. So keep that in mind when you're adjusting your timing. We have a pretty good base now, so let's move on to step two. Squash and stretch typically happens before and after a strong impact. So in this case, we want the ball to squash when it hits the floor and stretch when it jumps up off the ground. You can use the top and bottom controls in this rig to control the squash and stretchiness of the ball while also maintaining volume. The frames we need to add are squashed when it's in contact with the ground, stretched as it leaves the ground, back at rest and pose at the top of the jump and then repeat those actions as it falls back down to the ground. Start by squashing the ball down at the first frame and keep in mind that this also acts as anticipation. So make sure the squash matches the intensity of the action. A small jump needs a small squash and a larger jump usually needs a larger squash. With the squash made, we can now move a few frames forward and add a stretch. Depending on the timing, these actions will happen fairly quickly after each other. And just like with the squash, you want to match the stretch for the speed that the ball is going. With the squash and stretch done, we can now move to the middle keyframe and set the ball's rest pose. So select the control and press Alt G to clear all transforms and set a key. Now you just want to do the exact same thing, but in reverse. And you can even duplicate the same scale values and move them across to keep it consistent. And when you're done, it should look something like this. With two principles under your belt, it's time to master the third, and that's arcs. Almost everything in the real world moves in an arc, and it's even more present in animation as it makes things much more appealing to watch. And this doesn't look very interesting, so let's give it an arc. If we add a keyframe on the X location, and at the end of the animation, move it a few units, we can see that the ball kind of moves in an arc. But to visualize the arc properly, we have to select the main control, and head over to the Bone Properties tab and create a motion path. Here we can see the trajectory of the ball and it's not quite moving in a clean arc. If we change the keyframes in the X location to linear by pressing V and then updating the motion path, you can see that the ball moves in a much cleaner arc. But in reality, balls don't bounce at the same speed forever. They lose momentum and they eventually stop. To replicate this, we can duplicate all of our keyframes a few times and move them over in the graph editor. Next, adjust the X location keyframe so that the ball moves continuously along, adjusting the timing so that it feels like the ball comes to a natural stop. With each bounce, the ball will naturally lose its momentum. So each time the ball bounces, you can reduce the height. The same goes with the squash and stretch. This should reduce after every bounce as the ball has less and less momentum. You can even add a subtle roll as the ball comes to a complete stop. Remember to track your arcs, keep tabs on your timing and spacing, and always remember to use squash and stretch. And when you're done with all of that, you should have something that looks like this. But why stop there? Keep practicing with heavier objects, lighter objects, and even different objects. Now you know how to implement three of the 12 principles of animation. But what about the other eight? Well, you can take a look at this video where you can learn even more about animation in Blender.